the Creative Business Webinar. Um, I, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm Whitney English. I am the writer and creator of Day Designer, a yearly strategic planner and daily agenda for people who want to live a well-designed life. Today, I am here to talk to you guys about important framework strategies for starting and growing your creative business. If you don't feel like you're in a creative industry, you're still going to get a ton of value out of this webinar because we're going to be giving you all kinds of tips and tricks that you can apply to your marketing strategy if you're a non-creative business. Now, as a quick example, when you're building a house, you have to have a framework. And when, you have, when your house has a strong framework, you know that the house is sheltered from winds and storms. It's not going to blow over when the tough stuff comes. Without a framework, you know your house would quickly fall apart and that you would be exposed to dangerous elements. So what I'm trying to give you today is a framework that's going to keep your business sheltered from dangerous elements. The first thing that we're going to do in this webinar is show you how to identify what stage of business you're in. We're going to talk about businesses from a five-stage standpoint so that you can figure out what next steps you need to take for your business. Uh, now, if you're just starting out, don't worry because, again, you're going to be able to use this framework where you are. You don't, we're going to talk about business from beginning stages all the way to a business that's flourishing in its prime stages. You're going to be able to, even if you just barely have an idea or maybe even no idea at all, you're going to be able to use this information to help you grow, grow that idea into a business. One little caveat about some of this information. When I start telling you guys about these five stages, it's going to be really tempting to want to jump to the last stage and just do everything that a business that's flourishing is going to do. But you can't do that. The fun stuff usually happens later in the business cycle, but it's really important that you make sure that you have fully crossed through each stage that we're going to talk about before proceeding to the next one. If you don't do that, it's like trying to build a second story on that house before you have the first story built. That would not be a sustainable business move. So today, I want you guys to grab some paper and take really good notes. The information in this webinar is going to be some of the clearest, most valuable information you will ever receive. And I've been in business for a long time, and I'm not exaggerating. If somebody had given this to me 10 years ago, my life would have been very different. I can pretty much guarantee that you've never looked at your business this way before. And I can tell you from personal experience, when you apply the information into this webinar, it can change your business. So along the way, I'm going to also let you in on some of my business secrets and some of the things I've learned from the School of Hard Knocks. I want to share those with you so that you don't have to make those same mistakes. But I want you to have a sustainable, profitable, and business that helps you balance your life with your business. And that's what I, that's, those are my goals on this webinar for you guys today. So we all know business isn't easy, right? If business was easy, everybody would be doing it. But there's a few, there's a handful, a handful of a few of us who've decided to brave those waters. What you may not know is that when you look at business through the framework of communication, it can be a whole lot easier. Yes, we still have to crunch numbers. There's no getting around that. But when you stop to realize that every single one of your actions communicates something about your business to your audience, you can get a lot more strategic about what you're telling the world. A fancy word for communications is content marketing, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You may not realize it, but you are all content marketers. As business owners, you are all creating content that you're putting out there to the world, and that's marketing. Yes, you may design weddings, you may be stationers, you may be magazine publishers or bloggers, or even stylist, but every single thing you create and put out there into the world, from your email signature to your packaging, is communicating something. I learned that in college in my Communications 101 class, that you cannot not communicate. In order to communicate effectively and be effective business owners, when you can, we have to communicate to the world in a clear way. Communicating in a confusing way is not enough. That clarity is so important. 
In order to develop a strategy that clearly communicates what you do and how you can help grow your customer or audience, you have to create content. So let's look at the definition of content marketing here. A marketing technique of creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and acquire a clearly defined audience with the objective of driving profitable customer action. Question for the group. Would you say that one of your objectives as a creative business owner is to drive profitable customer action? Is that something you want to do? Answer in the chat box. Interact with me. Absolutely. Yay. Me too. So we're going to talk about a few examples of people who have done some great content marketing lately. Um, and these are creative examples. Again, if you're from the corporate world, um, have fun looking at the pictures. These are probably a little bit um, more bright and colorful than what you are used to looking at. So the first great example of content marketing I wanted to throw out there today is, is Ojoy. I don't know if any of you read Ojoy.com. She's a blogger. She, I think she's been online since probably about 2003 or 2004, something like that. Um, she's done some really big things, some product licensing deals with Target, but all of this is presented through the content of her blog. So this is her homepage as of this morning, and she's talking about her deal with Target, and that's where she's getting her revenue from. Target was probably in interested in working with Joy because um, of her blog because she puts high quality content out there in a blog format. So for her that probably means some great writing, some great photos, um, and just communicating things visually in a clear and compelling manner. Her content is extremely visual. The next example I'd like to give you guys of great content marketing is my friend Ashley Brook. Um, this is a screenshot of Ashley Brook Design's Instagram account as of this morning. Ashley Brooke does a great job of her content strategy with her content strategy on Instagram. She actually got to hear her talk about this at Pursue. She's a great example of somebody who really knows what her brand is about, and she creates innovative, inspirational, visual content and shares that in brief snippets on Instagram. And she does a really great job of this. She's using Instagram as one of her primary content platforms, which is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit. This is another content platform I wanted to give you guys as an example. I don't know if you know about um, the Girls with Glasses. Um, these are two girls I've met at Alt Summit before, really adorable people. They have a YouTube channel, and their content creation strategy primarily revolves around creating innovative and creative video content. Um, video content can be highly viral in the creative world today, online today, and they do a really good job of, um, you know, I, I learned how to braid my hair in one of these videos, was watching Brooke White, you know, show how you do a French braid in your hair. And she sets it to cute music, and she's quirky and charming, and just great content, fun to watch. Another example you guys may or may not be familiar with is Glitter Guide. And this is kind of back to a blogging concept like Ojoy. Um, probably what's different about Glitter Guide than Ojoy blog is the revenue source. Glitter Guide is a blog that's built on a magazine format, and they use advertising revenue to drive, uh, they use advertising sales to drive their revenue. So on that bottom right hand corner, that box that says incredible or inedible, that's an ad. Somebody's paying Glitter Guide for that above the fold ad space, what they call it. It's high up on the, the type line ad across the top there, that banner ad. That's one of the things that's driving Glitter Guide's revenue. Um, so those are four examples of different types of content that can be generated online today. There's also content that can be generated in the real world. Um, this could be like direct marketing, um, you know direct mail, this could be cold calling, um, and these are things that we typically see the corporate world adopt to really quickly. Um, the strategies that I'm going to be talking about for you guys today are going to be a lot more online because that's where innovation is happening. And as creatives, 
I believe that you'll have a cutting edge in business in the future if you adopt some of these strategies. They're also less expensive to adopt. It's a whole lot easier to write a blog post, a whole lot less expensive to, to post something on Instagram than it is to create a direct mail campaign or hire a bunch of people to cold call your customers. So we're going to jump to this, this picture right now. We're going to, today, everything that we're going to talk about is going, we're going to talk about in the framework of one of five business stages. We're going to walk through these business stages together. So this, this framework, um, I derived this from the research of a guy named Adesis who wrote a lot of books about something he called the corporate business life cycle. Now, I'm an analytical creative, which means I like to research a lot. And as I was researching and reading about this and learning about this, the business life cycles this guy offers, I realized that there really wasn't anything like this for creative professionals. There really, you could look at the corporate business life cycle framework, but it really doesn't apply to what some of us are going through in our businesses right now in this online world. So the body of research, um, that we're going to talk about today that I've done is based on the concept that creative businesses share the same life stages as corporate businesses but communicate very differently. That's why we're going to talk about online business strategies and not necessarily real life strategies. If you guys want to talk about real life strategy or in, in person strategies, direct mail type things, traditional corporate strategies, just let me know and we can, we can hop back and forth between the two. But you could actually take a lot of this content and apply it as a creative communication strategy on to a corporate business and have a very effective marketing and communications plan. So the five stages we're going to talk about today are pre-launch. In the pre-launch phase, your business is just an idea, or maybe, not, maybe you don't even have an idea yet. Maybe you're still kind of hemming and hawing, and you just know you want to start a business, and you kind of want to start it online. The second stage is the present stage. And in this stage, we're going to talk all about how to establish your presence online. In the publish stage, that middle stage, we're going to talk about how you can consistently produce content online. That might be one of the hardest stages, actually. They're all very different, as you'll see. The fourth stage is the promote stage. And this is going to be when you're required to consistently put yourself out there. And the fifth stage is the prime stage. And this is the stage in which your business is really flour flourishing and has become a well-oiled machine. All of the businesses we just looked at, and the Ojoy, Ashley Brook, Girls with Glasses, Glare Guide, all of those businesses are probably in the latter three stages. They're probably consistently publishing, really trying to promote themselves, or flourishing in prime stage. And here's your, ta your task for today. While we, t while we talk through each of these stages, I want you to figure out which stage your business is in and start making a to-do list of things that you need to do for your business. That's going to be your action list that you walk away from this webinar today with. Before we dive in, I wanted to give you guys this visual. I almost pulled it out of the webinar slides today, and I thought, no, I think, that's a, I think this is a really good visual example of what, uh, this is a bell curve, bell curve visual, and the dots on the line sort of plot the rise of a business and where you can, where you can go. So I just wanted to share this with you guys. Before. Does anybody have? Does anybody want to share what what business stage do you feel like you're in after kind of running through that? Do you do you have a guess? Just guess. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. We're going to dive further into this, but share with me in the chat box what stage do you feel like you might be in? That'll help me also kind of tailor some of the content to. Different people. Cool. We've got some people in published stage. We have some people in present stage. 
some published stains. Okay, so so kind of maybe a lot of us are kind of right there in the middle. Yeah, I definitely um, I definitely feel you know just personally sometimes I feel like I'm um, stuck in that published stage, and we can talk a little bit about why that's. It can be a little bit hard to to push through that. Okay, so some you know Bonnie's saying she's still unsure. Definitely, let's let's dive into this. We'll talk a little bit more about it, um, and maybe you'll maybe you'll feel differently at the end of the webinar. So level one, the characteristics. Level one is called pre-launch. The characteristics of the pre-launch phase are that your business at this point is a hobby, an idea, or a dream. This this is a passion phase. Um. You're going to be getting a lot of energy from that passion, and so it's going to be very easy for you to focus on your business in this stage. You will probably be spending hours and hours of time on Google researching and trying to figure out how to make your idea work. The number of employees is going to be one. That's going to be you. Um, pretty low revenue. Your friends and your family might be hiring you, but you also might be doing some jobs for free to build portfolio work. Um, and the struggle is that you're going to be dealing with in this stage is actually existence. Are you going to do this or not? The pre-launch phase can often look like curiosity. This is just something you're dabbling in. You're going to see where it goes. Um, you, all, you think out loud a lot. Your friends and family really might sort of get tired of hearing you talk about and these ideas that you have, and you're, you're, you might just be verbally processing them out loud. And you you may be you know throwing up a website, just seeing how it looks. And um, it's not an actual online presence yet, but you just you know you heard that you're supposed to have a website, so maybe you've kind of tackled that in one way or another. Problems you're going to experience in this stage are over excitement. You are going to want to talk to anybody and everybody, all your friends and family. You may totally burn people out about talking about this idea that you may or may not launch. The, the details are going to be a little bit fuzzy. You're not really going to be sure about how it's all going to work out. So then you're going to probably talk to even more people and drive even more people crazy with this little idea that you've got. All of that's awesome. None of that's bad. If, ignore the naysayers on that one. If they tell you it can't be done, this is a good time to ignore them. Um, you might be experiencing a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You might feel really insecure. Um, can you really do this? You know, can you really make this idea happen? That might be, those might be some thoughts kind of running through your head. And then you probably have some mixed goals. And you know, just on one hand, it's, I want to make some money. And then on the other hand, it's, I want to change the world. And you might be kind of flip-flopping between, um, you know, do you want to take your business down a moral route and, you know, help save the world? or or is business really need to be have a focus on profitability? And there's a balance in that, but at first that's that's a struggle that a lot of people have starting out. So on this pre-launch phase, the level one phase, this is this is your heaviest to do page, um, heaviest to do phase. I've actually got two pages of check mark boxes on this page. Um, on the, first of all, on the pre-launch phase, it's First thing you have to do is market research. Who is your customer? And it's all about customer, customer, customer. Typically, creatives start a business because they want to express themselves, and we we want to make our own mark on the world, leave our own mark on the world. But this can be a huge mistake. Zig Ziglar said that the best way to get what you want is to help other people get what they want. So if you'll make your business about your customers, you'll eventually get what you want. And that's what market research is. Figure out who they are. Figure out what they want. Figure out what problems they're experiencing. Figure out how you can offer them solutions to their problems. If you don't know who your customer is just yet, it's going to evolve anyway. Just start. Just brainstorm that on paper. Um, and if, you, if you're already on social media, you can do an audience survey and just start from there. But if you're just starting, and um, the point about getting to know your customer is is just to kind of think about who they might be and start trying to get to know them. That that customer audience will always evolve. Next thing, write a business plan. The purpose of the business plan is to get it out of your head and onto paper and to quit driving your friends and family crazy talking about your ideas. <laughs> a bank or a lender will probably never ask for a business plan. They might, and if they do, it would be great to have it on hand. Um, but a business plan will force you to outline your strategy, 
And the process of doing that will bring your business a lot of clarity. It will bring you and your business a lot of clarity. So write a business plan. If you Google how to write a business plan, you're going to get a million little things that pop up, little outline things. You can just copy and paste it. Next thing, get really friendly with Excel. When I started my first business back in 2002, I estimated that there were about 2,000 brick and mortar stationary retailers in the United States. That was my customer. And I felt like I knew that customer. I felt like I knew that what they wanted was prompt service and innovative product. So my next task was to figure out how much I thought they would buy. So I opened an Excel spreadsheet, quantified how many cards how, how many cards can I print for how much money? How much is this going to cost me? And then I plugged some numbers in on how much I thought they would buy. And my goal was to get that business to a million dollars. And that Excel spreadsheet allowed me to figure out how many cards I had to sell to sell a million dollars worth of cards. It also helped me figure out the profitability. You know, if, I, if, if a box of cards cost me $2 and I sold it for $5, that's three dollars of profitability. And using the Excel functions, you can figure out. You can actually put together a spreadsheet that can change. I'm not a numbers person. I googled it. I figured out what formulas I needed to put into Excel. I'm sure if I had handed that Excel spreadsheet to an MBA, they would have laughed me um, off the planet. But it gave me the information I need, and it really helped me figure out what kind of goals I needed to set for my business. Step one on that exercise for anybody who's highly creative is going to be open Excel. <laughs> Step two is going to be just put some numbers in there. I know that can be a challenge. Next thing on this list, um, establish your business name and reserve your social media accounts. There is a website called Namecheck, N-A-M-E-C-H-K.com. Somebody wants to type that in the chat box for you guys. Um, I would recommend looking at that for reserving your social media accounts. Don't worry about getting the accounts pretty. Just get them reserved. The next thing you need to do is legally form the business. Um, most of the time you can do this by Googling uh, you know, business requirements, um, LLC requirements, and then the name of your state. And more and more states, probably almost all of them now, have this online. You might want to talk to your CPA about what kind of business you want to establish, but most of the time it's an LLC for tax purposes. Um, third thing, you're going to want to get an EIN. So you can Google, e e I, just Google EIN and the IRS website is going to pop up. And you can click on that top link. And I, did, I checked it this morning. All you have to Google is EIN to get that registered. Next thing you want to do is set up a business bank account. This is a mistake I see a huge number of creatives making. It will cost, I think it's free if it's a small business checking account. You can go to Bank of America, um, your local branch, and get a free business checking account after you've got your um, EIN number. Sometimes you can even open the business account before you have the EIN and they'll hold it for you. They'll allow you to come in in the next week or so and put your EIN on it. But make sure that you don't muddy your personal finances with your business finances. So get that business bank account, account set up on the go. I, seriously, you guys, I, have, I know people that have been in business for years and still don't have a business bank account. So if that's a step that you haven't done yet, go back and do that. Um, next thing, get business insurance. Again, this is a really simple thing. Um, call your local insurance agent and have them write a, a policy. My husband sells insurance. It's probably going to cost you 150 bucks. He would tell me not to tell you how much it's going to cost, but it's probably not going to be that much money. Um, next thing to do, file trademarks. These might be trademarks for your business name or might be um, for your product names. Um, you can do this as you go. You don't have to file all your trademarks all at once, but if you have, um, if you're not calling the business your name, you're probably going to want to protect yourself by filing a trademark for your business name. And then if you have unique products, you might want to file a trademark for those product names. Carolyn asks, what kind of insurance? Um, small business insurance. Um, your, 
your insurance agent can probably ask you a few questions to help you figure out um, what kind of insurance is best for you. I don't know what the technical word for it is. I think it's called, um, it might be E&O, it might be errors and emissions. Um, I don't know the technical term, Carolyn. I'll, I'll ask my husband. <laughs> he will be happy to tell me. Liability insurance, yeah. Um, and also, Rachel, I know you're a photographer, and you're going to want to get your equipment insured. I'm sure you already have that done. Um, but yeah, really, really important. Carrie C says so she has general liability insurance. It's probably good. So your insurance agent will talk to you and ask you some different questions about your business because it depends on if you have inventory or equipment and things like that. And so he will, um, he or she will, will help you make um, just the right insurance decisions to cover your hiney. Mariah says, uh, make sure that no one has your name trademarked already. I made that mistake once. Yeah, that, that can be tough. You can actually Google, if you just Google trademark, just the word trademark, the government website for trademarks will, will pop up and you can get on that website and you can actually do a trademark search. So if you're in the naming process of a product or a business, check that out before you go very far. Um, I've seen that in the paper industry a lot because a lot of times people call call things, this, you know, paper. They use the, the word paper in their name a lot. And so, there would actually be um, companies that we would sell to that had the same name. And it did, yeah, just check it out. Make sure you can get that URL name too. Okay, next list. Find your voice. I realize that's kind of a really esoteric um, challenge right there, but the way you find your voice is you write. Um, and so something that you can do in the pre-launch phase before you've even gotten started is just start writing. Um, I recommend Evernote. I use the Evernote application on my phone. I use it on my computer a lot. And I've started doing a daily diary thing where I just jump on there and I just force myself to, to write, to find my voice. Um, if you're not a writer, um, finding your voice might be an artistic medium. I, you know, Ashley Burke's voice is really strong on Instagram and that's all about the pictures that she takes. And so that might be something you just want to think about, look around. As you look at other um, creatives and their marketing strategies online, ask yourself what kind of voice they are speaking the loudest in and think about how that might apply to you. The next thing you're going to want to do to say is, is decide on your com communication platform. I put blog here because that's a common communication platform for a lot of people. But it could be Instagram. You may, you may decide that you are just going to build a brand on Instagram and that's it. Like that's going to be the one channel that carries your voice. It could be Twitter. It could be Pinterest. It could be Tumblr. Um, it could be a podcast. That might be, with, with, that's not necessarily a platform in and of itself, but it is a distinct channel where people can literally hear your voice. It might be YouTube. Um, it might be, decide that, be that you decide that you want to use um, YouTube or Vimeo. Vimeo is a cool video service platform as well. Um, I would recommend picking a primary communica communication platform. It's really tempting to want to, to do all of those things. And while I would recommend, the, recommend reserving your name and locking down your name on all those platforms, you may want to only choose to communicate through a primary um, one or two of them. The next thing is start working on consistency. Consistency is going to be your biggest battle as mine as a creative. And use a calendar and to start holding yourself to some sort of publishing or writing or some kind of content creation schedule, um, whatever you decide to do. Start practicing now. The next thing you can do is that you can actually set up your social media accounts. So I told you on the last slide to reserve them. Now you can just go in and kind of put your color, you know, just put some colors on them. Put consistent colors on them. And the point of this, this step is to get the egg off of the Twitter profile. You know, get the little gray, little white person on the gray background, get, get that little person off the, off the avatar on um, the Facebook page. Um, and, and again, um, well, I'll, I'll jump towards this. 
a lot of a lot of times creatives think that we need this big fancy brand to get out there and go online and while that's eventually eventually important, don't spend a lot of money or time on that right now. Um, it's going to be really important that you define your core and um, to jump on to jump further down this list and it, it, I, would, I just I hate seeing creatives come right out of the gate and spend a lot of money on branding and only to redo it a year later. Um, because they kind of got it wrong right off the start. So if you wanted to pay somebody to do an inexpensive logo for you, you know, spend 150 bucks on that. Buy a pre-made logo off Etsy or something. But don't spend a lot of money on branding just yet. Not in your pre-launch phase. Another thing you're, you're going to want to do is choose a hosted email provider. And I mean by email provider, I mean something like MailChimp or AWeber or I think Emma is an email provider or iContact. I recommend MailChimp to start out with because it integrates with a lot of other stuff and that can be really useful down the road. So y'all are totally having conversations. I just kind of I just kind of glanced over at the chat box. Awesome. Keep swapping that info. Um, get your get your domain name reserved. Don't worry about launching just yet. If you can get WordPress up on your site, some, some hosting providers have a one-click WordPress install, they call it. That's awesome. I personally use DreamHost for all of my domain name registrations, all of my hosting, and then, and then they'll do the one-click. I can do the one-click WordPress install and get WordPress up in 10 minutes on a site. So just, but the important thing is just get that URL reserved. Start defining your core, and this is this is an evolving process. Um, being continuously aware of what your values are and what you're trying to communicate to your customer, and that you're communicating those things clearly. N and none of us can put too much energy towards that process. So start now, and don't be afraid to come back and evolve it later. I always tell people. All branding is really DIY branding because you can't expect a creative agency to know you before you know yourself. The creative agency just provides the logo. You have to provide the creative agency with your core so that they know what they're trying to reflect to your customer. My recommended read for this phase would be Seth Godin's Tribes because really um, Tribes talks a lot about um, who your people are, who's your audience, your, your, who are your clients and your customers. And at this point, you really need to be starting to think about how this business is going to be about your customers and not you. And that kind of helps you think about that. Has anybody read any of Seth Godin's stuff? I'm kind of curious. I'm a big Seth Godin fan. Has anybody read Tribes? It's a quick, easy little read. Okay, level two. We are now talking about the present phase. The characteristics of the present phase are high productivity, no planning. You are going to be putting your presence out there online uh, for the first time. The revenue phase on this is a little bit more than the last phase. No big jumps. Number of employees is still one, still you. Uh, the struggle at this point is survival. You may be getting a lot of friends and family business which um, really contributes to that survival struggle because a lot of times friends and family are kind of looking for a favor. They kind of think they're helping you get started. And, and sometimes working for friends and family is not the way to, to keep a business going. There's also very little plan in this phase. Um, I'm, I'm trying to solve that problem for you by giving you some steps to go forward. The, this, this phase also looks like finding your tribe. You've thought about these people. You're, you're, kind of, you're kind of getting anchored on who they are, and you may be integrating yourself into their culture or their world. You may be experimenting with different voices. You may be playing around a little bit on Instagram, playing around a little bit on Twitter, seeing, seeing which online group feels, um, feels like it might be your tribe and your voice. And then you're also probably playing around with this blog thing. It's really hard to have a business now without having a blog, but you don't want a stagnant blog. Um, I do think it's totally possible to build a really successful business without a blog. So um, that's something that people normally at least try out because it can be a lot of work if you, 
um, want to do it the right way. Okay, problems that you're going to experience in this level two are having to move to plan B. There's this constant challenge of what is plan B. Plan A is not going to work all of the time. So it's really important in the stage to learn to be flexible and just roll with the changes. Um, another issue, the audience may experience problems with your platform while you're trying to get it online. Um, they're just like we had just this morning, you guys. I mean, the platforms don't always work well, and sometimes you have to kind of deal with um, things that go wrong. You may be trying to find revenue in this in this stage. So, turning that friend's wedding, that that friend or that family member's wedding that they've asked you to help with, turning that into something profitable. And sometimes that just means stepping up and saying, "Hey, I'm going to have to charge the big bucks for this." Even though your family, I'm, I'm trying to do this for a living, um, and and that gains some respect. So that's that's a good thing. Um, there's few procedures, policies, and, um, and systems in place. So you may be taking on weddings and having to go back and and put some structure into that, put a client experience process into that. There's a lot of stress in, on home and family life. Typically, as business owners. We can be we can be really good at putting out fires for our clients. Um, I think we get really good at jumping when our clients say to jump. But doing jumping all the time and constantly putting out fires in our own businesses can get a little bit stressful in home and family life. And so that sometimes in this stage we haven't learned to manage that quite yet. So things that you can do in this phase: create an audience survey. So if you're if you're leaning towards Twitter as your primary platform, maybe you put a survey up and you throw it up to Twitter. Or um, if you are leaning towards Instagram or your blog or your Facebook page or whatever, and um, consider doing a survey for that audience. Uh, work on your unique value proposition. So unique value proposition is fancy old school marketing language for features and benefits, and features and benefits is fancy old school marketing language for pains and gains. What pain is your customer experiencing? That's something you're going to want to ask them in a the survey. You may not want to say pain, but you might want to say what problems do you feel like you're having? What are you struggling with right now at home or in business? Um, and then the gains is going to be what you can offer them as a solution to the issues that they might be having. It's kind of going back to this concept of Zig Ziglar. If you help other people get what you want, They'll help you get what you want. So think about how you can help them win in their life and their world, and I'll try to offer them those solutions. Um, continue the self-discovery process. So continue to think about that, that process can take a long time for some people. So continue to think about what your core values are, what your core is, and what your values are, and and how your people and your tribe and your audience and your customers might be relating to that, that core of you. Always, always, always engage with your audience. And I'll be totally up front and say, I am not the best about this. I have been off of Instagram for I feel like almost a week now. It has been one thing after another, and I just haven't had the energy to get on there and engage, but it, it really is important. Um, also in this phase, if you can install WordPress in this phase, that would be awesome. Um, WordPress, for those of you who don't know, is a content management system that a lot of bloggers use. But it's evolved in recent years to be a very stable platform for just a website in general. So even if you don't have a blog, I highly, highly, highly recommend um, the WordPress platform. Actually, President Obama used WordPress as a platform during his last campaign. So I'm figuring if they can use it for a political campaign, you know, for the President of the United States, that pretty much anybody can use it. The one ex exception for that would be a corporation that has to have some kind of massive security in their database. But for us creatives, it's a great place to start. Next thing, start gathering leads. And what I, what I mean by this is start collecting email addresses. There is more content created every single day than there was ever created in the history of the world before 2003. So there is more content created every single day than there was created in the entire history of the world before 2003. That's a lot of content. If you write a blog post and put it out there, it's not enough. You're going to get lost in the crowds. People will not find you. 
if they do find you, it's going to be very hard for you to stay in touch with them unless you get their email address. The creatives making the most money online these days are the ones that are collecting email addresses. Um, the ones that are making even more money are the ones that are sending out consistent content. An email strategy campaign could be, that could be a primary platform for someone. It doesn't even have to be online in the social media sense. It could just be that you're creating content and sending it out in a newsletter once a week. Um, it's still a very much a digital strategy not necessarily a social media one, but it can be a very, very, very effective strategy. So it's, it's not about being pushy. Um, the, the, I think that's another thing that's important to, to talk about at that point. Um, you do have to have calls to action in your strategy. Um, but it's not a, you, you, they don't have to be big pushy calls to action. But that's another mistake that I feel like even I make. I, you know, people want something, and I just am not giving them a clear path to, to get there because I'm trying to be not pushy. And it doesn't help anybody. So start gathering leads. Start getting those email addresses. Um, for WordPress, there's actually a plugin for those of you who feel like you might be in this phase. There's a plugin called Magic Action Box that a lot of people use. Um, it's a widget that you can put on your WordPress website that allows you to put a sign-up form on your website. So install Google Analytics at this point in time. You can go to Google Analytics and set up an account and get that um, little piece of code on your website. It's really easy to do. And then my recommended read for this stage is e by Michael Gerber. So I would really recommend reading that at this point. Okay, level three. Characteristics of this phase are um, life is just all about the business. Like you're, you're kind of living and breathing and eating and sleeping by this content that you have to publish to the web at this point. Um, you're at this point in the business, you're an editor and you need to be considering yourself the editor in chief of your content publishing business. You're probably going to be going from a single employee, you, to um, an assistant, maybe a part-time assistant, maybe even a couple of part-time assistants. Your revenue, you're going to see a significant increase in your revenue at this point, but the struggle is going to be profitability. When you start to make money, it's really easy to just go. It's really easy to forget. I mean, when you start your business, it's all about making money. Then you start making money, and we forget to remind ourselves that really it's about profitability. Um, this says, in this phase, you're going to be establishing a lot of processes. You're going to establish your client experience process in this phase. You're going to be implementing your strategy, living and dying by that content publishing strategy, and which might mean blogging a lot if you decide that that's a platform for you. Problems that you can experience in this phase is over self-confidence. If you're going from $2,500 to $50,000, it's going to feel like quite a ride at this phase, um, and maybe even more than that. Um, Everything kind of becomes a priority. It really starts to feel like it's working. Um, and so we're sort of motivated as human beings to do more of what's working. It's that reward center in the brain going off. Um, so if we're not careful, we can become overworked in this phase. Um, the thought that we're, a lot of us are thinking is, where are we going to get our next customer? Got to do more of what's working. We sort of forget who's going to pay the bills sometimes. Maybe it might be time to hire a bookkeeper, um, which is going to lead you to your first employee learning curve, which might be unclear communications and expectations, realizing that people can't read your mind. So I think probably one of the first lessons I learned in business was I just had to be patient and, and really try to communicate my expectations and, um, and have realistic expectations as well. The founder is very indispensable at this phase. They are, they are absolutely in demand. The, and the employees aren't trained quite yet, and the founder kind of has to do everything. Um, lack of budgeting, I kind of briefly talked about that. Need somebody to help pay the bills. There's lots to criticize. And so on this, I would really like to encourage you guys on the concept of feedback. Um, I got some really negative feedback from somebody who bought a day designer 
um, the other day, and I'm very open to feedback, but I really had to take that one in context. Um, it, there was some valuable stuff, and I did make some changes um, for Etsy description because of that. I'm still not necessarily sure um, I agree with it. I made the changes because I want to be open to feedback and see if it works. Um, but I kind of had to put that one in the, the bucket of non-constructive feedback. And I've had to focus my eyes on feedback that's a lot more constructive. So just remember that. Don't be afraid to filter the feedback. Um, also in the phase, there's a lot of hope for miracles. Like you just kind of hope the problems are going to fix themselves because you're the founder and you don't have any more time to fix these people's problems, um, which might lead to major crisis that's going to test the founder's commitment to the company. So here, here's your to-do list for this phase. Establish your key messaging. Um, whenever I, um, at my first company, we had hit um, our first seven-figure year, and I thought it would be great for us to invest in some media, what they call media training. So we drove down to Dallas, hired a firm, paid a lot of money, and sat in a room with them for a day. They asked us what our values were. We threw out some responses. They came back and they said, your values are innovative service, uh, you know, innovative design, excellent customer service, and humble beginnings. If CNN or Oprah or your local newscaster or a buyer at a trade show or somebody walking into your office sticks a microphone in your face and asks you a question, it could be what color is the sky? One of your, you have to pick an answer from one of those three key messages. And they basically said that um, this is a communication strategy and a commu communications tool that will help, help our business um, communicate clearly to our customers and our audience. So you might think about using um, a process like that and asking your growing team at this point to consistently communicate that messaging. The next thing at the phase is use editorial calendar. If you're on WordPress, there's actually a plugin called editorial calendar that can be a huge help, especially if you've got lots of people starting to publish content to your blog uh, or even to Instagram or something like that. And in this phase, use the Quadrant tool to prioritize. So the Quadrant tool is um, a tool um, invented by Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And on that tool, he basically challenges you to focus on what's important and not urgent. So for me, this meant that I needed to quit putting out fires, just let the fires burn, and focus on the important things. And sometimes right now I feel like that's just my family. Like the fires are just going to burn. Um, I have to focus on getting done what the next most important thing is. So also on the space, put a budget in place. Hire somebody to help you do this. There's some creative consultants out there that are really helpful. I use um, a gal named Michelle Loretta um, from Sage Wedding Pros to help me with my business budget. So I would recommend giving her a call if you find yourself in this phase and don't really feel like you have a grasp on your numbers. Establish a staff meeting week schedule weekly. So even if you um, have assistants and virtual assistants not all over the place, try to do a Google Hangout once a week and just get face-to-face -face with these people. Um, a great staff meeting process that we use is have done and to do. So we kind of just go around and each of us in that staff meeting will go over what we have done that week, and then we'll go back around and we'll all say what we need to do. So the have done's kind of create some victory moments and we're, we're, we're able to celebrate a little bit. And then the to do's help us refocus on where we need to go. Um, next thing, write an employee handbook. Um, this is also something that Stage 20 Pros can, can help with. Um, they actually have one I think you can buy. Um, if you know of, if, I mean, if you're over 15 employees, you probably need to find an HR consultant in your area and run that by them and just make sure that you are meeting all the legal guidelines required by your state. The, um, the book I would recommend would be Traction at this phase, and it really is all about managing employees and setting goals and things like that. Even if you don't have employees, I would highly recommend reading that book. And, and using the traction process for, 
for yourself at a, at a once a week meeting and um, just a meeting with yourself once a week. Um, consider selling if opportunities arise. So if you read the e he's going to tell you that the biggest asset that you can ever create is your business. And I've actually written a blog post about how I would like to sell Day Designer. And the response has been so interesting because um, a lot of people say, that's your baby. Why would you want to sell it? Or um, you know, they, they, think I'm, they think I don't want it. Or I mean, just a lot of different reasons. The response I've gotten to that post has just been fascinating. Um, but the fact of the matter is I created a product that's working and selling. There might be somebody that wants to come along and is willing to experience the profits of that and is going to allow me as, as basically an inventor and a researcher and an innovator to, to come along and create something else. So um, there are also opportunities I had to sell my old business at times, and I turned them down because the offers were for less money than we were going to generate in total revenue that year. I should have sold them. Should have, should, have, should have taken the money and run. So if you are selling it, if you've got a business and you have an offer to sell it, um, I would, you know, I'd be happy to have a 30-minute phone call with you talking about why it might be a really good move for you to do that. So definitely don't hoard your business. Just because you started it doesn't mean that you can't let it go. Um, and then Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I recently sort of realized that start with why is definitely a marketing strategy. It's not really a starting strategy. We just covered a lot of stuff that you need to do before you, before you get to the point where you're really starting to consistently communicate with that why. So level four. Characteristics of this level are going to be um, your try and test, like see what works. You've gotten that consistent publishing schedule down. Now you want to see what people respond to. You want to start measuring those posts. Massive revenue increases when you get to this level. Um, frankly, I feel like I'm someplace, um, I, I feel like I'm on the publish level, personally. I don't feel like I've gotten that consistency down. So definitely I'm not measuring the response to, to blog posts just yet. Number of employees, you're probably two to five at this point. If you've read the traction book, um, you're going to know and a lot, a lot of different ways about how to handle that. Your struggle here is going to be resources, time, money, and people. This looks like really consistent content, great social media coverage. You may be at this, you may be at the phase where you feel like you've been able to merge a lot of those platforms into one strategy. And consistent email marketing. You've got that list that you that you have that you can use now. Problems are going to be people and training. Um, lots of times founders have this thing I call bright and shiny theme syndrome. And employees like stability. So, so they don't like it when, and when a founder runs off and chases another bright and shiny thing. Um, because of the bright and shiny things syndrome, um, the founder can actually create a loss of vision in the company. So when they start, uh, I am totally guilty of this. When I start sharing my next best idea with my team, I'm taking their focus off where they need to be running, and I'm asking them to look at a new thing. So as founders, we have to be really careful not to do that at this level. And there can be confusion of goals because of the same thing at this level. The, um, oh, the Brian Training Syndrome I just talked about, the founder's leadership style might be called into question because of this. The founder is constantly chasing the next best thing. May not be a very good leader for the company. It may be time to bring somebody in who can manage better might have to let it go. Even if you don't sell it, you might have to let go some of the control as a founder. And that's totally fine. We can do that. We're grown ups, right? Um, you might have to consider an infrastructure upgrade or reconstruction at this phase. And I say that because you know, even if you're on WordPress, um, it may be that that your website, you know, if you if you if you have a business that was sixteen thousand SKUs, my old business peaked at about sixteen thousand SKUs. WordPress couldn't handle that that we needed a much larger database. And so if you get to that point, you might, you might need to revise the website at this point in time. It might be time for a rebrand or an overhaul. Um, and then the lack of a profit-based scheme. If you don't have the right financial structure in place at this point, if you haven't gotten help with that budgeting stuff yet, it's going to be really easy to forget that profitability thing at this point. So things to do at this phase. Consider creating an email incentive to help your list and help build your list. So this might this is going to be something that 
your, your customers and your audience need needs to be free to them, it's going to feel like you're giving something really valuable away. Here is the secret on that. This is, the, this is huge, you guys. When you're giving something away, it's really important to tell them what, but sell them how. So many of you might be familiar with Marie Forleo's B-School, and many of you might have watched her launch videos. Those launch videos, just, they just tell you, all she does in those videos is tell you what she's going to talk about. She doesn't tell you how to do it. That's what she does inside B-School. And what she does in the videos is tell you the what, and then inside she's telling you the how. So on your email incentives, that might be something to think about. You need to give away something really good to get people to opt into your list. But that's what, you tell them the one, tell them how. That's one thing. That's one way to look at that. Um, create email marketing templates. So get inside your hosted email provider and maybe pay a graphic designer to do some great consistent email templates that just look good all, all across the all across the board. Um, consider selling advertising on your site. That's back to the whole glitter guide example. They've got the advertising on their, banners on their site. Um, that basically makes you an online magazine of sorts, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a, um, definitely a business model strategy that's working for some people right now. You could also consider working as an affiliate. So the only affiliate thing I've ever participated in is Marie Forleo's B-School. Um, but frankly, I could, you know, you can be an affiliate for a lot of things. I could, you know, I told you I use DreamHost. If I wanted to sign up to be a DreamHost affiliate, I could. Um, a lot of people make some decent money on their affiliate links. So maybe at this phase, stopping and putting an affiliate links page up on your website, um, referring people more business might be helpful to your revenue stream. Um, start creating products and packages. Um, this is definitely something that you're probably going to touch on actually before in this phase. Um, it could also be something where you get from level one to four really quickly, and you really don't need to start looking at that until this phase. I don't really feel like I'm in the promote phase yet, but I do have products and services that I offer. Um, install Google Authorship. So, so Google Authorship is a, it's actually a piece of code that you install on your website that allows Google to verify that you are who you say you are. Um, this is something that is kind of starting to replace the SEO concept. Um, SEO is kind of dying, and um, it is the credibility of the Google, part of it's being propelled by Google authorship, but credibility is really helping. So boost people's website traffic. So this, whenever you Google something, um, you know you see somebody's picture beside a result. So if you Google you know, how to start a stationary company, um, you know, it, hopefully, I've written a blog post on that. Hopefully, you'll see my picture up there on the left-hand side of the results. And anybody else who's written a post that has Google authorship installed on their site, their picture would appear as, as well. People who don't have Google authorship installed um, don't have their pictures appear. So it definitely helps for SEO. And always, always, always engage with your audience. And the book I would recommend for this phase is The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. So definitely an interesting read, but he talks a lot about running a really big, busy business um, on four hours a week. So it's just kind of an interesting read. I think you can't work four hours a week to get there, but once you get there, I think you can have set up a business that allows you to work like them. Okay. Our last level is Prime. So characteristics of this level are that the business is even-paced and stable, and revenues have significantly increased and are kind of over the top. Um, number of employees, probably over five, and the struggle is return on investment. So you're going to be investing time, money, resources, people, and just making sure that there's a return on that. And that can get really hard to track um, at this level. So a lot of times you could bring in a consultant to help you if you have trouble with that. Um, hopefully, as a founder, you're going to be working on the business and not in the business. 
that's, that's a hard one to transition us out of this phase. And um, the phase, during this phase you are, the prime phase, you are really flourishing. But the content that you are producing is, is being monetized. So for Ojoy, that's her target license. For Ashley Brooke, her Instagram post, posts are driving sales to her e-commerce site. For Glitter Guide, the traffic that's being driven to their site is producing revenue from, from their advertisers. Um, but their content is being monetized. Another thing that this phase looks like is automated marketing. So I realize that's kind of a weird word for some people. I use a platform, my email provider, I use a platform called Infusionsoft. It's, it's an investment when you get into it, so I would recommend not looking at it until you get to stages four and five. Um, but it allows you to set up email campaigns within the system that run automatically. There's all different ways you can do that. In fact, there's a whole conference you can go to about how Infusionsoft has a big, they call it InfusionCon, and they have a big conference on automated marketing. But it's definitely something you're going to want to look into as your business grows. So problems at the stage are going to be that sometimes the founder doesn't see the prime stage. Um, a lot of times it's because they don't know how, they're still working in the business, they don't know how to get out of the business and, and work from an outside standpoint. Um, there's a desire to maintain the status quo. So you were putting out fires in some previous stages and all of a sudden things start to run really easily and, and everybody kind of wants the boat to quit rocking. And so there's a tendency towards stabilization. And that's great if we all want to get comfortable, but it's really bad for innovation and staying ahead of the curve. Um, I talk a lot about um, the story of, of Chick-fil-A. We have a Chick-fil-A in our town. Love Chick-fil-A, right? Who loves Chick-fil-A? Do I have some Chick-fil-A lovers here? Um, a while ago, right after the Chick-fil-A came in to town, there was an, another chicken restaurant that came behind it called Cane's. And Cane's opened up from Chick-fil-A right across the street. One day we were driving, we were going to go through Chick-fil-A, and I looked across the street and I saw the Cane's, and I said to my husband, let's just go try that. Let's see, you know, let's see what it is. So we drove through. Got chicken once. Excuse me. Haven't been back. Haven't been back to to that that Cane's restaurant. So if I was Chick Fil A and Cane open across the street from me, I would probably be a little bit annoyed. But when I realized that as a as a, one of their customers, as one of Chick Fil A's customers, I was not interested in going back to Cane's. I asked myself why. And I realized it was because it's not just the chicken. I mean, Chick-fil-A chicken's good, but I mean, chicken is chicken, right? It's because I love how clean the playground is at Chick-fil-A. And I love the lemonade at Chick-fil-A. And I love that I can get a diet flavor of lemonade at Chick-fil-A. And I realized that Chick-fil-A isn't worried about trying to shut down the canes across the street. Chick-fil-A is worried about making everything around their chicken the best that they can be. And so that's kind of... At this phase, that's kind of how you have to look at your content strategy. Because there's no new idea under the sun, and content is, is going to get knocked off. Like, that's just the reality of it. But if you, if you, if you take the Chick-fil-A move and you say, okay, well, I'm creating this content, and how can everything else I create around, how can the content be awesome? Because the, chi the chicken is good chicken. It's not mediocre. Um, but how can I create everything else around that to be really good content? Um, <clears throat> you'll win. You'll be... You'll be hitting the nail on the head. You'll be selling chicken, but so much more, if that makes any sense. So um, you, it, at this stage, if you don't realize that, you don't just start perfecting and perfecting. And from an innovation standpoint, it's going to be really easy to start backsliding. And you can actually go backwards on – I'll flip to this slide, slide really quick. And you can get up to prime and you can go back down to promote. You can lose you can lose lose ground and have to go back and recover it. So it's really important to think about um things from that standpoint. Um stay entrepreneurial, keep the innovation alive. Um often in this phase there can be no sense of urgency. It's it's kind of it's kind of, you know, people as human beings, we just want to stay comfortable and keep that status quo going. So um, to-do list for this phase. 
First of all, plan your marketing campaigns in advance. You can use your editorial calendar to do that. Um, it's really hard. Uh, you might bring in a marketing consultant just level to do this. Again, I don't feel like I've really effectively done this for where <clears throat> I and my, and my employees are right now. Annually review employee performance. Um, again, Michelle Loretta, Stage Wedding Pros, they have a great employee manual book that you can buy. And I think they have some employee review tools in there. Analyze your sales funnel and customer filter. So I could probably do a whole webinar, a whole other webinar on that on that topic completely. But, but the, to summarize it, basically, you're going to want different tiers of products. You're going to want that email opt-in that's free. People pay for something with an email address. And then you're going to want a $50 product, and then you're going to want a $150 product or service, and you're going to want a $500 product or service. And, and you're just going to, I call it a customer filter because as the price increases, the number of people that are going to want that product or service go down. But it allows you to, to offer a few things at a variety of price points and allow, and allow customers to experience things at a variety of price points. It's important at this phase to start new projects so that you don't get stagnant. Also important to do a monthly accounting check-in. Um, annual, annual budget planning, your CPA can probably help you with those two things. <clears throat> Automate your marketing. I talked about that with Infusionsoft, um, putting a market, an automated marketing plan together for that. There's a great graphic called um, the News Guide to Online Marketing, N -O, o B, News Guide to Online Marketing. It's a couple years old, and it's a lot of information on one infographic. If you Google that, um, it's a it's a similar you know overview walkthrough to some of the stuff here. Um, you're going to want to integrate e-commerce at this point. So e-commerce platforms. I mean, you might already you might already have e-commerce. You might have done Etsy. You might be using Shopify or Magento. Um, for me, Infusionsoft actually has a shopping cart. I have not integrated that yet, but that's something that you're going to want to do so that you can. Um, track the track the purchases or the services that your customers are buying in um, a content relationship management system. It's called a CRM. That's why I use Infusionsoft. It's a little bit of a it's a CRM, an e-commerce shopping cart, and um, and an email host. So for me, that hits a lot of a lot of these elements on the way up. And then the final thing is just don't get too big for your britches because if you do, you're going to slide back down to the other stage. And it's important to stay, stay humble and stay hungry. Um, so um, that's pre that, that pretty much summarizes it. I had to look at my notes really quick and make sure I covered everything. Does anybody have any questions? I've, Carol has asked in the Q&A box, would it be possible to review the level one and two to do list. Um, yeah, I'll flip, I'll skip back to the. Um, I'll put this on the screen here really quick. Here's level. Here, there's there's actually two lists for level one. So here's the first one on that. Does anybody have any questions? Where do you guys feel like you are after hearing that, after going through the webinar? What stage do you feel like you might be in? Rachel says, I kind of feel like I am in different places. Is it necessary to go back to the beginning? No. If you feel like you're in different places, I would just go through and make sure that you can put a check mark beside that to do. It may, be, it may not be like a to-do that you feel applies to your business. And, um, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I would say think long and hard about crossing it off um, because these are proven best practices that a lot of companies use in these phases. Um, but definitely there's an element of editing. You know, we know we can't be everything to everybody. So there is a way to do um, what's right for you and be effective about it if you have focused on your customer, who's your right customer, and they're working to solve their problems and meet their needs. 
Um, there were some other questions. Um, Dijonet says, what would be the best way about pricing products and services when you're first starting out? So the best advice I've heard on that is from Jasmine Starr. She's a wedding photographer. I think she started her she shoots weddings. I think she started at a $300 or $600 price point, and she raised her prices every three bookings. So every every time. Every three customers, every three customers that reserved a spot for her, she raised her price three hundred dollars. I don't know how much she is now. I think eventually she stopped that process, but capped it out at some point. Um, but definitely make sure you're making money. Open that Excel spreadsheet. Make sure that all your expenses are covered. Make sure that you're making a little bit of money on time. For those of you who do stationery, that's an exercise we walk through at Stationery Academy. Um, it's pricing your products and services. Um, so make sure you're getting your expenses covered is something I would say. And then raise your prices as you feel like your demand goes up from there. You can always lower your prices. If you feel like you're pricing yourself on the market and you're not booking anything, um, lower them. Do not ever lower your prices because someone tells you that your prices are high. Like they're just trying to get you to come down on your price. When they don't book you, you'll have the answer. But don't ever lower it just because people are telling you your prices are high. That's not a good reason. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, Mariah says she feels like she's got a couple things on a couple to-do lists. I, I feel the same way. I definitely feel like there's a mix in there. Um, Let's see what else are people saying. Still in the publish stage. Mariah says, any blogging tips? I, I feel like I'm all over this place. Yes, I um, I would recommend coming up with a few consistent topics and trying to stick with those topics. So Ashley Brook Designs does this really well. If you want an example of a blog that has a consistent publishing content schedule, I would look at her blog. Um, you know, she does this thing where on I'm I'm gonna make some stuff up here. You know, on Mondays they talk about manicures. Then on Tuesdays they talk about trash television shows. And then and this is not what they talk about, but I'm just making stuff up. Um, you know, then on Wednesdays they talk about what kind of wine they're gonna drink. And then on Thursdays they talk about what happened on Wednesday in the office. It's really consistent every week. They actually apply that same concept to their Instagram as well. And if you don't know what topics to talk about, I would look at your values. I would look at what you're spending your time and your money on. And I would say, look at that. If you're spending a lot of money on clothes, you probably need to talk, you probably need to be a fashion blogger. You need to talk about, you know, you need to have jeans Wednesday and Fancy Friday and um, Pajama Monday or something, you know, Pajama Sunday. You need to talk about the stuff that, that's important to you that, that you spend your time and money on. So obviously for people who are moms, like that's why mommy bloggers are mommy bloggers. They're talking about their family stuff that's important to them. They also might be talking about homeschooling or they might be talking about, um, you know, where they have gone for family vacation or the books that they're reading to their kids. Um, if you are in more of the professional world um, and you are not doing things from a personal standpoint, I would say talk about, um, you know, think about what your customers want. Um, a, lot of a lot of times in the online world, your audience is going to connect with you as a personal brand. That's definitely um, a big thing in the creative world. In the corporate world, you really need to get into what your customers want. So if you're a real estate agent, your blog might be all about um, tips on how to buy a house, um, things to avoid when buying a house, things to look for when selling a house, things to look for, you know, things to avoid when selling a house. Um, the interesting, other interesting thing about content, especially if you're in a, in a more of a corporate type setting, is you could come up with a list of 15 things that you consistently talk about and you might just consistently republish those 15 things over and over and over again on your blog. 
Um, you're going to rewrite them every time. You're going to kind of regurgitate it. You're going to you're going to always be including the latest research and the latest updates and information. Um, just because you write a blog post about a t you know 15 things to avoid when selling the house, just because you write that blog post one time doesn't mean that it, that content cannot evolve and you cannot post it again. I would say change the title up, but you know keep the concept the same. So don't be afraid to come up with for your editorial calendar. Don't be afraid to come up with a list of consistent um, topics and and just keep reusing those, reuse them over and over again. Okay. Um, more questions. Hang on, guys. Um, oh, Carol wants me to post level two to do list. Um, do you guys, those of you that have questions, do you mind posting them in the little Q and A box? They're a little bit easier for me to read in the Q and A box. Um, Rachel says, what about people telling you to raise your prices? Raise them. Who's telling you that? Is it your customers? They're telling you you're too cheap. I mean, Rachel, I've seen your work and I think it's amazing. And so if people are telling you to raise your prices, I'm not surprised. You probably need to raise them. Act like, no, hang on. I was about to say, I was about to say act like a big deal. But I realized it was going to sound really bad. I just, what I mean is own, own the compliments. I mean, if people are telling you your stuff is good, Say thank you, and and don't be afraid to hold your shoulders back and realize you've done a good job about that. It's not about being arrogant; it's about being grateful, you know. And and I know, I know a lot of you know what I mean. Um, let's see, Rachel, did you, I can't see if you said something. Other vendors are telling, yeah, Rachel. I mean, especially if other vendors are telling you to raise your prices, they they may feel they may feel like they're losing business to you because you're not expensive or uh, not expensive enough. They may feel like you're kind of bringing the industry down. And so I think that's interesting. You start slow. You don't have to raise them. You don't have to double your prices overnight. Just start with a few hundred bucks every couple of bookings, like Jasmine Starr said. A great question. Kelly asks, how do you decide who your content audience is? I'm a graphic designer and I've been toying with the idea of a blog and trying to figure out what content to offer. So Kelly, I would say think about what kind of graphics you like to do. Um, you know, if you're a graphic designer that also does calligraphy, you might like working with wedding clients, you know, the wedding industry, that, that trend is really hot there right now. Um, if you like grays and blacks and blues and the corporate suit type stuff, you may want to do corporate logos um, or graphic design. I have a friend, Emily McCarthy, who somehow, somewhere, developed this massive following of pediatric dentists. And she does logos all the time in her sleep for pediatric dentists. Not glamorous, but very profitable. So, um, Look at what's working. Um, look at look at your best work and figure out what that is, and um, what what you can stand behind, like what the work that you're proud of that you've done, and and think about what those people need. So the question to ask yourself always is just, you know, what do the people need? What do pediatric dentists need to know? So they need to know. Um, actually, you know, a great idea would be to. If you've, if you've developed a niche market like that, to just call. Like just pick up the phone and call some pediatric dentist or whatever around the United States and say, can I ask you a few questions? Like what do you need to know about running your business? Because they have a degree in med school. They don't they have a medical degree. They don't have a business degree. They might need to know um, how to position chairs in a waiting room. They might need to know the, the, the most soothing colors to paint their waiting room walls. Um, you know, these are things that you could, you might have the answer to. You don't even know you have the answer to, but you just have you have such a different knowledge base than they do. You really kind of have to figure out what it is that they need. Um, if you're an interior designer and you're deciding to go after pediatric dentists, you might blog about what colors to paint the walls. Um, you know, and you may feel like that that's giving valuable information away. But remember, 
that it, it, what, it doesn't give information away, it actually builds trust. And when you tell them what to do and they do it and it works, then they come back and then they hire you. So, um, you know, how many times have you seen a graphic, you know, somebody hire you because, if you're a graphic designer, somebody hire you because the logo that they, you know, got off the internet, you know, wasn't what they wanted it to look like. You know, a lot of us try to go the cheaper route first and then we realize that there's value in paying the higher price later on. And so sometimes that's worth it. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you so much. I am going to send you guys all a complimentary recording of this webinar. Um, please don't pass it on. It's, it's, um, it's yours and yours alone, and please don't share it with anybody. Um, um, I, but I am a little bit, I'm a little bit frustrated with meeting burner, so I just want to do that as a thank you to you guys. Um, thank you for joining us. Remember about the, the Year Designer giveaway, so feel free to um, post a snippet, a picture, and some, something that you learned on this on Instagram or Twitter with the creative this strategy hashtag, and I will pick a winner on Sunday. So thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon, and um, I hope to see you all around later. Bye-bye.